Um, now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Eric Rogers. Mr. Eric Rogers is a, um, a Senior Vice President of Operations in Business Development within the Professional and Technical Services Group at GP Strategies. With over 25 years of experience in adult learning and training consulting, Eric oversees the strategic approaches and successful launch of performance improvement projects and services focused in a wide range of market sectors. He works from Pottstown, Pennsylvania in our, one of our GP Strategies offices, and prior to joining GP Strategies, Eric proudly served in the United States Navy. Eric, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Kayla, and welcome, everyone. Unfortunately, I have broken the cardinal rule of a 20 to 25 minute presentation and I've got about 21 to 22 slides. So without any further ado, I'm gonna jump right into it. And let's start with your typical problem statement. When we're talking about a capital expansion and the opportunity to drive for operational readiness, there's some very significant facts that we've gotta consider right out of the gate. First, 64% of CapEx projects exceed their original budgets. That's an alarming statistic. And as much as 30% of the original expected value is lost in an ineffective transition as you drive to that operational readiness and transition from your construction to operationalizing your facility. Unbelievable, but 73% of CapEx projects are frequently delayed beyond their original scheduled launch. And all of this data is derived from a variety of different reports, both GP strategies collecting information, but the likes of Accenture, PwC, Human Factors Engineering, Performance Magazine, and the last one, the Construction Industry Institute, they found, this is a really alarming statistic, 975 industrial projects, only 5.4% of those actually met best in class predictability in terms of their cost and their schedule. So that's a bit of an opening alarming statement and it kind of drives us immediately to the point around striving for operational readiness is you're trying to achieve a vertical startup. So in order to achieve a vertical startup, I'm gonna to try to do some illustration here. You can see this blue line that comes up here. This is what we call vertical startup. And you can see you're up to design capacity very, very rapidly. As a matter of fact, in a very, very short period of time, once you throw the switch, your facility is able to hit design capacity, make saleable product, and that is exactly what the shareholders and the investors and owners of that organization are striving for. Unfortunately, reality kind of creeps into the situation and we end up with something short of that. And you can see this is a little exaggerated here, but this jagged line actually indicates what we typically see in a lot of our startups that we, we get called to to try to support facilities with. And there's a whole host of reasons as to why they're not able to achieve that vertical startup, but it's a human element impact is typically what a lot of the these delays are associated with. And what's rarely important, I'm gonna jump from this graphic into another one, is what GP terms launch value degradation. And that is essentially, as a company, a company is looking to actually achieve this vertical startup. So again, our green line here, you can see from a time-based axis as well against the value and driving to try to get to your capacity. If we can achieve this capacity by this time point, then the company is going to be on target for its budgets and its fiduciary expectations, and you're gonna be able to make saleable product. Oftentimes what we show here in the blue dotted line is what many of the facilities will attempt to achieve as part of their budgeting process on a CapEx initiative. The unfortunate part and the reason for this webinar is this lost opportunity is what we typically see. Because this is what is actually occurring out there. And unfortunately, as you can see down here at this end, the value and the capacity, we are sub value and we are below design capacity for a period of time. And it, obviously on this graph, we don't know, we're not trying to specify that, but that is costing the company and the owners of that facility a great deal of money and those are the type of product delays and launch value degradation 
that absolutely can be avoided if we can achieve operational readiness. So too many, again, if I go back to our opening slide, too many of these CapEx projects are exceeding their budgets at 64% and over 70% of them are behind schedule. And really, it kind of leads to, well, why is that happening? Obviously, there's a lot of different reasons and there's no way in a 20-minute webinar that I'm going to be able to highlight every single profound reason, but there are three significant blind spots that can be addressed. The first is operational readiness, and there's a significant gap associated between, be it a construction firm or an EPC that's turning over to that eventual owner. Many times, the owners are already assuming that that workforce that they have on site is fully prepared and capable of operationalizing that facility on day one. And unfortunately, for a host of different reasons, that's just not what typically occurs. The second one is what we call price pressure and optimization bias. But in this particular case, it's a combination of both of those that basically leads us to believe that a lot of the personnel associated with the project can tend to be overconfident. And in that overconfidence, they tend to fail to address potential, potential risks, either one, as a price pressure, they don't allow the budgeting necessary to take care of the human element. In other words, the training and the learning systems, the documentation, and all of the things that comprise getting that workforce truly ready to take on that facility. And the second one is the, optimi um, the optimal bias, which basically means that they honestly believe that they're more ready than they really are, and they haven't tested themselves. And that leads us to our third one, which is project management structure. And although there's tremendous effort applied in the upfront analyses and the project management associated with a CapEx from the technology side, too many owners fail to establish the right kind of structure associated with the human element. So therefore, there's a lack of contingency plans to address what's going to happen if this isn't ready. So these are three very, very quick blind spots that I wanted to introduce you to. So I, I want to get our focus really back to that operational readiness, and I want to tie it in with the human capital or the workforce portions. So let's, let's take a look at today's workforce concerns. And talent shortage is one of the most significant things that very few of our facilities ever think about until they're actually closing in on the oper operation date or the pre-commissioning and commissioning phases. And quite frankly, manpower itself has, for three years running, listed that the technical subject matter expertise and the talent, that's the number one shortage is anything with a skilled trades capability. So a lot of your mechanics, a lot of your electricians, your instrumentation control personnel, your technician specialists, the folks that are going to be the operational backbone of that facility is the number one talent shortage across North America. And in many of the other developed countries around the world, that is also holding true, especially places like Germany and the United Kingdom are experiencing the exact same statistical uh, situation. We have a tremendous lack of STEM skills. So your science, technology, engineering, and mathematics skills even though that's certainly part of our um, secondary education curriculum, it hasn't been an area that socially we have focused a lot of attention on. So therefore, our generations have basically wandered away from this STEM capability. So those skills are not readily available, and that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on these facility owners in order to try to close that gap. The third bullet speaks to something that has often been talked about, it's been talked about over the past decade easily, is the aging workforce situation. And recognizing that at least for North America, the baby boomer generation has already begun its retirement stage. And statistically speaking, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're talking about 10,000 individuals per day that are retiring from the workforce. Now, those aren't all associated with just manufacturing or facility operations and engineering, et cetera, but there is a substantial portion of that. 
and that is adding to this talent shortage situation. The last two bullets are also very important from our workforce concerns perspective. One is because of the project duration, and a lot of these projects are not necessarily just a, a brownfield or a line initiative. They are an entire greenfield operation that may take as, many, as much as 24, 36 months, maybe even longer. During the course of that setup, we've got a lot of personnel that may be expatriated from their home area. They may actually just be living on the road. There might be a number of different issues, but over any type of project that has that kind of duration, you'd be surprised what the personnel turnover numbers actually are. So that's something that is not often factored into the strategy associated with the human element. And then the last one is the competitive workforce losses, which we've seen and experienced in multiple cases where a significant new facility is being built and the surrounding workforce drives itself to that new facility. Lo and behold, a year and a half later, another new facility is being built and the personnel that, that were originally brought in to run that actually start migrating to the other new startup and that creates a, uh, a considerable competitive workforce situation. So all of this leads into our talent strategies and the root cause of what I wanted to speak to you about, which is quite frankly in general uh, GP strategies experience, the very nature of capital expenditures, organizations are very adept at being thorough and precise in their technical design, their equipment selection and the process layout. However, even to this day, the value and impact of the human element or the human capital is still in the process of being quantified. And that means that very few of these startups actually take the same type of rigor and, and precision in building their strategy on how they're going to launch an operational readiness associated with that CapEx as they turn it over. And if you see that little statistic down the bottom, that 80%, in this particular case, Human Factors Engineering has cited that over 80% of the errors associated at facilities is based on a human error, and that's because they are more often than not improperly trained or in ill-prepared to assume operational readiness of that facility. And that kind of brings us back to how do we strive to achieve that human capital uh, preparedness and that operational readiness. And what you see on screen here is a little bit of a graphic that tries to give you both a timeline along the bottom and some key flagged opportunities in the life cycle of a CapEx opportunity. So I put three little ticks there. Believe it or not, it would be outstanding if about 18 to 19 months before you actually go live, you're starting your training and development process. That does not typically occur. That is certainly an ideal statistic, but it is, it is oftentimes less than 12 months when organizations like ourselves are called in to try to support a situation because there has been a lack of focus on the human element. But you should be looking at getting your on-site training coordinator in place, starting with your assessments and gap analyses, you should be developing and, and finalizing your training plan. You get your, and when you get even still a year out, you should be developing your documentation. Even though we know that there is as built or as designed, and there's probably only an 80% completion or accuracy, getting that head start is so important because then your workforce has the opportunity to, to familiarize themselves with the procedures, simulate operating the equipment with those procedures and become very comfortable with what are the next steps in any type of a situation, be normal startup or an emergency situation. You can see down along the bottom in purple, a lot of what we're talking about there deals with maintenance and reliability aspects. So even again, a year and a half out, you should have a maintenance strategy already being formulated including your reliability analyses, your FEMA workshops, and then getting into your PDM and, and uh, any of the rest of your predictive maintenance, your CMMS strategies, all of the things associated with the reliability of that particular facility need to be done 
easily 18 months out. And those are going to tie in with your human capital preparedness. So let's, let's, oops, let's take it back to the people again and focus at this point on our learning approach. What I've put up here, and obviously this isn't going to be one size fits all either, but this is an opportunity for everyone to see all the various elements associated with the learning approach, starting with simply a, an advisory board. It makes an awful lot of sense that you have a learning strategy associated with the workforce. What boggles my mind is that companies will invest literally billions of dollars and they will wait till less than six months before they start up to really focus heavily on what I consider to be the penultimate criteria, and that's the people that are running the facility. So try to focus on creating that advisory board, create the vision and mission associated with your learning approach, and then you've got to start with a workforce analysis. And I've got a few other graphics that will expand upon that workforce analysis, but let me take it forward and say from there, once you understand a workforce that you're going to have, their roles, their responsibilities, the skills and knowledge and abilities that are going to be necessary to safely and efficiently operate that facility, then you can start to design the program. And in many cases, we have dealt with many clients that will immediately go from zero to 60 and they'll just say, well, we want this design and let's start to develop this strategy. And unfortunately, they haven't even taken into account the workforce analysis necessary to really understand what are the various roles, what are the tasks, so that they have very clear understanding of what type of training is necessary to ensure that workforce is well prepared. Tied to this, learning is not just sitting in a classroom. You have got to make sure that you have blended learning strategies, especially with the, the talent shortages that we have and the new generations um, that are entering the workforce. You have to have multiple modalities that are going to allow you mobilized training. You need to make sure that it is highly tactile with hands-on, heavily integrated, get out of the classroom, get their hands on the equipment, on the processes, on the simulators, so that they are better able to practice and prepare for real live operations. Make sure that you've got a training design that incorporates piloting and the ability to adjust and evaluate your program's deliverables. And then obviously management of change falls in at the last end of this learning approach. And then I want to talk to you about putting it all together, and I kind of have this slide out of order, but the truth of the matter is, if you take this learning approach that we just discussed here, and then we also build in this milestone chart that I'm going to walk you through, you combine those two, you have the framework of what's necessary to have a successful capital expansion that will lead you to operational readiness by focusing on these six core elements. Obviously, the engineering of the facility and the CapEx is required. Workforce analyses. Then you've got to have all of the documentation development. You've got to be able to have a maintenance reliability strategy in place and operationalized. You have to have training design, development, and deployment. And all of that is going to lead to key elements necessary for a vertical startup. So let's actually try to drive that and put it all together with this map. And I expect for many of you, as you're looking on your screen, this is nothing short of an eye chart. Well, I'm going to do you a solid here and just provide an opportunity that at the close of this webinar, we will include uh, an email address for any of those of you that would like a copy of this. We have it in poster size, and it's basically almost, uh, I'll call it two foot high, four foot wide. Uh, it gives you an excellent opportunity to look across that 18 months and understand color-coded here, what are these core elements associated with that workforce development? So let's start with the engineering, and these are the ones that are the easiest. These are the things that you understand would absolutely occur during any CapEx. You're going to have feasibility studies, you're going to have front-end engineering, you're going to go through the process engineering, the facility and utility setup, the procurement support, et cetera. Those types of things 
are, I will almost call old hat. They're expected, they're built in, and they're prepared for. But the workforce analysis, that is not something that is always built in. You can see here the forming of the steering committee, developing the programs that are dealing with the organizational design, operations and maintenance strategies, and making sure that, that you have the, the right team in the right places. Starting with that core team selection, you've got to have exceptional leadership that you're bringing on at this point, you're easily over a year short of the actual start date. You should have that leadership on board and starting to prepare the rest of their workforce. Programs are gonna be set up. The competencies are gonna be outlined. You're going to have any additional gap analyses and qualification plans. When, and all of that is in place by the time you're even at the pre-commissioning stage. Unfortunately, the reality is, is I have witnessed this where those competencies and qualification plans are just being started once we're already deep into commissioning, and then that leads to launch delays and schedule overruns. We go from there into our documentation development, and again, we are at a point where we're looking at this documentation is dealing with all types of policies and procedures, any type of process descriptions, anything associated with the business process mapping. You can get into all types of LMS consideration, learning management system, and how are we going to populate all this documentation? How do we make the, the documentation management from a technology and an IT perspective? How do we provide that to our employees? Is the employees going to have to have some type of mobile capability to access that? And with today's technology, there is a tremendous amount of really neat things that can be done that are kind of mind-blowing. The only problem is, is we jump to that technology solution, but we fail to take the time to understand how does that human element integrate with that solution. So oftentimes, even though the technology is definitely a catalyst and it does work, what we lose is more of that value degradation that I talked about at the beginning because the workforce is ill-prepared to use and leverage that technology, and so therefore it may be six, nine, 12 months after an initial startup before the true value of that technology is actually realized. Very true in the procedures world. Then we jump to our maintenance and reliability, and again, I don't wanna be repetitive, and I am running short on time. So, you're, you're setting up your programs, making sure you've got your asset health plans, your KPIs are set up and you've gone through your risk management, but then you're working through your, the rest of your documentation and the visualization, and, and then obviously after the launch, you're working towards continuous improvement from a maintenance reliability perspective. Everything that we talked about is also around training and learning system. Blended learning has to be part of the solution, and you can see down here this is a great example of blended learning where there may be operations, there may be OJT, there's equipment walkdowns, there may be things like large control diagrams that are integrated into this, there may be simulators that are required, but you have to blend all of that together into a cohesive manner that allows your workforce to truly be ready to operationalize that facility. And a vertical startup follows. So I'm gonna to jump to, like I had said, at this point, here is an email address. We welcome anyone that's attending on the call that would like a copy of this. Um, feel free to reach out. We'll make sure that that gets mailed to you. And recognizing that I'm running out of time, I wanna to touch on a couple real quick case studies that are proof of concepts and then summarize. I have four different case studies in, in the Recognizing that I'm running low on time, I'm gonna pick just two of them. I'm gonna start with the steel manufacturer at the top. One of the critical things, because they're, this, in this particular case, this manufacturer did in fact get us involved 18 plus months, almost 24 months ahead of the actual startup. Let's jump all the way to their actual startup dates. Three of their lines started ahead of schedule because the workforce was prepared and ready to operationalize it in advance. Pre-commissioning and commissioning procedures involved the entire workforce 
and they were already trained, ready to go, procedures were in place, documentation was ready, the maintenance strategies were in place. They achieved a vertical startup and literally um, the first roll of steel manufactured was considered prime by the quality inspectors, meaning it was saleable product at the end of that very first run, almost unheard of. That let them achieve fiduciary goals and objectives that even blew their own investors and stakeholders away. They were over the moon with it, and what a critical thing here, again, was extensive focus on the workforce. They knew the technology was well planned, and it's not to say that everything else wasn't project managed very, very well, but the critical differentiator here was their workforce. I'm going to jump past the energy producer, and I'm going to do the same thing with a paper making. Uh, a paper making facility dealt with three different paper makers. They had vertical startup accomplished in all three of them. And again, when I talk about saleable product, all three of these plants internal produced inside of their first day saleable grade product. And again, it goes back to a workforce preparedness strategy that allowed their workforce to actually perform pre-commissioning, commissioning, and actual startup activities, everything was ready to go. And that workforce was completely operational ready, and they achieved tremendous financial gains. In fact, that led to two additional um, facilities being green-lighted for production. All right, so I apologize. I'm going to run out of time here. Let me give three quick summary points. First, make sure if you're trying to drive on a CapEx and achieve operational readiness, make sure it's a holistic approach. Just like we had talked through, it's got to include not just your engineering, but your workforce analysis. It's got to have the documentation, maintenance reliability, and the learning strategies in order to achieve that vertical launch focus. Secondly, the human capital strategies have got to be integrated. It's a missing element that needs to be quantified, and there's a lot of data out there that tells us if you address the talent acquisition development and the retention strategies, you will differentiate yourself and you will have one of the best in class launches in comparison to your competitors and peers. And lastly, your turnover and turnkey strategies, that's where most of this falls apart, if, uh, you know, based on our experience. Absolutely, in the process of that transition between an EPC and the construction to the the end user or the owner of that facility, making sure that that workforce is fully prepared to receive the facility, and you'll notice I use the word in a compliant manner, making sure that they understand all of the regulatory compliance necessary, as well as safety and operational uh, excellence, that's very, very critical. So if I'm monitoring my time, I've literally left myself one minute left for what we had designated so, Kayla, I'm going to turn back to you and see if there are any questions from the audience. Thanks, Eric, and yes, there are. Um, and thanks for that great presentation, too. We only have a few minutes left, well, actually about a minute left, so we can go um, over just a bit with some of the questions that came in. So just as a reminder, if you do have a question for Eric, be sure to enter it into the Q&A module at this time. Um, he covered a lot in a, uh, about 30 minutes, and there's obviously a lot more information that we could be discussing. So we do encourage you to continue the conversation with Eric beyond today's session. His contact uh, information is going to be available on the slide deck, and we will send everybody a link to a follow-up blog post where he'll be addressing some of today's key takeaways. I'd also like to remind you that the recording and slides from today will also be emailed um, to the email address that you provided. So without further ado, we'll jump right into these questions. One second, let me get them open back up again. Okay, so how far in advance of the scheduled startup would you recommend starting on the training? Okay, that's a, that is a, a terrific one. Ideally speaking, I would love to see us start 24 months in advance of the actual startup date. Uh, Realistically, I'll accept 18 months. I, a lot of times I'd still consider that pretty good, um, if not very close to ideal. Uh, unfortunately, the reality, um, we're often called when there is six months or less time left, and it becomes more of an ambulatory 
process rather than a dedicated workforce. And the workforce itself feels that, recognizes it, and it does impact um, them. So back to your question, I would say ideally 18 months, Kayla. All right, great. <clears throat> Next question is, outside of the human aspect, what in your experience is the largest contributor for cap uh, CapEx delays? Oh, wow. Um, let's see. Uh, talent is still one of the, the leading issues, but clearly, um, I mentioned at the very end, compliant, regulatory compliance awareness and their requirements is one of, uh, one of the leading contributors. Um, op optimism and preparedness buy-in-ness and, and the price pressures, I talked about that at the beginning of the, the presentation. One on price pressures, unfortunately, these are very expensive initiatives. So of course, when they have to add additional cost, that creates a lot of pressure, that creates delays in the decision making. And then oftentimes, even though the, the opportunity was presented in a timely fashion, the actual decision and clearance to get those monies and funding available there is a tremendous amount of compressed time then that, that has to, all those things have to occur in a very short period of time. So I would say price pressures, regulatory compliance um, are, are two of the, the biggest things to me. Great, and I think these are gonna be some of the things that you might be addressing um, in the follow-up blog post. So we look forward to um, hearing more on this topic. It doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. So we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up. I apologize, we went over by a few minutes. But thank you again to today's speaker, Eric Rogers, and thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We do hope that you'll join us again for one of our next sessions. We have three more sessions on the schedule between September and October, and you can find a full list of these sessions on, uh, at gpstrategies.com under resources and our news section. So for GP Strategies, I'm Kayla Rods, and I wish everyone a great day.